I'll just let Jody introduce herself and go through her presentation. But again, thank you guys all for coming on this Monday evening. I appreciate it. Great. We can give her a warm welcome. Right of applause. Thank you. So I'm really uh, appreciative of um, SJP for inviting me to um, talk with y'all tonight. Because um, like so many of us, I've been really just in awe of the student um, organizing and fearlessness over the last five months. Right? Like y'all have just demonstrated so much bravery and taken real personal risks um, just to stand up against you know, Zionist lies, and institutional repression, and in the process deepening connections in the community and inspiring the whole region. So it's just really super important and great work. And for the last five months, the world has watched the US and Israel wage a brutal war of extermination against the Palestinian people. From the beginning, Israel's genocidal intent was clear. Cut off water, food, fuel, and electricity, bomb hospitals, mosques, universi universities, refugee camps, apartment buildings, announced the goal of wiping out Hamas while saying that everyone is Hamas, children are Hamas, South Africa is a legal arm of Hamas, um, UNRWA uh, workers are Hamas, and so on. Right? The kernel of truth in these Zionist lies is that Hamas is the leader of the Palestinian resistance. It's not just the democratically elected government of Gaza with a large youth and social services wing and army. It's, le it's the leading group in the movement for Palestinian liberation, right? supported by all of the left-wing groups. In the last five months, we've also seen, in addition to the horrors coming out of Gaza, and also I just, shouldn't just say Gaza, because of course they're unfolding in the West Bank, just as I was driving here, um, today, the IOF um, killed a 16-year-old in Ramallah named Mustafa um, Abu Shabad. 16 years old, he was playing with friends. And the um, IOF was allegedly looking for Hamas materials. And the kid was in another neighborhood playing with his friends. So just went over to visit a um, friend. So we've seen, um, in addition to these horrors, we've also seen a global outpour outpouring of solidarity. We've seen millions in the streets, Every Friday, um, um, every Friday, a million at least in Yemen alone, right? Yemen on has had these million people demonstrations on every Friday. How many folks here have been to a demonstration in the last five months? Yeah, that's what I expected, right? Um, there have been marches all over the world. Um, multiple countries have been re recalling their ambas ambassadors from Israel. They've introduced resolutions in the UN Security Council, only to have them vetoed by the US. So what's striking and what's undeniable is the clear division in the world. On the one side, the masses of people supporting Palestine, and on the other, Israel and their imperialist enablers and suppliers, most prominently in the US. More of our unified global uprising. What's kind of exciting about the global uprising too is it's like what was going on in the 70s and 80s when there were strong alliances between various national liberation struggles. By the end of the 1970s, Edward Said tells us, there was not a progressive political cause that did not identify with the Palestinian movement. Solidarity with Palestine united the left. Historian Robin D.G. Kelly says, we radicals regarded the PLO as a vanguard in a global third world struggle for self-determination, traveling along a non-capitalist road to development. Palestine stood on the front lines in a protracted battle against imperialism and settler capitalism. The Palestinians weren't victims, at least not in my political world. They were revolutionary combatants and thus models for those of us dedicated to black liberation and socialism. One of the ways that US imperialism tries to quell support for liberation struggles is by designating the groups that lead them as terrorists. A well-known well example is the ANC, right? Nelson Mandela's anti-apartheid organization that the US labeled terrorist. In 1996, the US passed the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, making material support for terrorism a crime. 
it's illegal to give money or other material support to any liberation struggle or state that the U.S. doesn't like, like Cuba, Iran, Syria, Korea. A clear effect of U.S. anti-terrorism is the othering or demonizing of liberation struggles. Revolutionaries defending people's rights of self-determination, rights to resist occupation and oppression are criminalized. This is why we've had to insist every day and every march that resistance is not terrorism. U.S. imperialism dictates regarding who and what can be defended are the context in which humanitarian aid work comes to substitute for militant political organization, the context where management substitutes for struggle, and NGOs and CSOs substitute for revolutionary parties. What looks like depolitization is actually imperialist state power, the power of capitalist as a class to structure the world so that they can profit. Humanitarianism is one of the masks they use to hold this in place, because who could be against humanitarianism? And these airdrops are just like one of the most horrific and cynical versions of this mask that we've seen, and we've been seeing a lot. Sarah Roy writes compellingly about Israel's deliberate transformation of Gaza into a humanitarian problem. It was a means of managing the underlying political issue, economic, environmental and infrastructural devastation pushes survival questions to the fore, forever postponing the political question of Palestinian statehood. Institutionalized humanitarian assistance then normalizes occupation. Most images of Palestinians that we see depict devastation, bereavement, and death. Palestinians' humanity is made conditional on their suffering. On the one hand, this helps counter racist presentations of terrorists and aliens. On the other hand, the dominance of the image of the victim produces the good Palestinian as a civilian, even better as a woman or a child. Those who fight back, especially those who are part of organized groups, are condemned, and the rest of us are required to join in that condemnation. Mainstream media in the imperialist core in keeping with Zionist and imperialist state practice, insist that any mention of Hamas or the war Israel is waging on Gaza, that it has to begin with condemnation. Condemnation of Hamas is a condition for speaking. Now this has been going on for decades. Tarek Bakoni describes watching news programs in 2014 when Israel was demolishing Gaza in Operation Protective Edge. Palestinian analysts were rudely silenced on the air for failing to condemn Hamas as a terrorist organization outright. Today, everyone is expected to speak as a state, to conduct themselves as representatives of a state, conditioned to act in accordance with practices deemed acceptable to the imperialist world order. The form of interaction is established in advance as norms of permissible speech. Increasingly, these norms are backed by the coercive power of public and private institutions as anti-terrorist legislation and expanding definitions of anti-Semitism penalize support for Palestinian liberation. Y'all all probably recall that in December, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a resolution declaring that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, and various universities have echoed this in their policies. The leader of the Palestinian liberation struggle is Hamas. Charlotte Cates, the international coordinator of Samadun Pal Palestinian Political Prisoner Solidarity Network, emphasizes every Palestinian left organization with any kind of meaningful presence is 100% on board with the development of the resistance, with the actions of October 7th, with the leading role of the Islamic resistance movement, and with participating in what's been called the Joint Operations Room of the Palestinian Resistance in Gaza and elsewhere. There isn't a debate taking place about this, and there isn't an internal struggle about this, and the Palestinian movement left organizations are 100% part of this resistance and supporting it. But the forces leading it, the forces that have the highest level of popular mobilization, the highest level of popular support, and the level of military advancement and development, are the Islamic resistance forces. 
In the US, the UK, and Germany, defense of Hamas is impermissible. When we recognize with Charlotte, with Charlotte Cates that Hamas is fighting a national liberation struggle, and that October 7th was a reassertion of the Palestinian revolution, we can see that the, pro, that the prescription against defending Hamas is an injunction to take a side against the revolution. Defending Hamas is forbidden because Palestinian national liberation has been repressed as a political project. What's appalling is how many prominent voices ostensibly on the left parrot official condemnations of Hamas, reinforcing the imperialist order the Palestinian revolution rejects. And I'm going to use one example. I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with um, Judith Butler. She's a well-known intellectual. Um, but I think a lot of the criticisms that I'm making can apply much more broadly. So this is standing in for a set of criticisms. And so, and this is, I'm using her essay from the um, October 19th um, London Review books. Rather than centering the 75-year Nakba and Palestinian resistance, Butler criticizes Harvard, Harvard students for a statement they issued holding the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. Butler's essay foreshadowed the attitude that subsequently overtook US universities. Instead of focusing on the brutal reality of apartheid occupation and siege, her, their concern was with students' mode of expression and how that made people feel. Against the Harvard students, Butler condemned, quote, without qualification, the violence committed by Hamas. To be sure, Butler does not think that such condemnation is the end of politics or that it precludes learning the history of the region. On the contrary, Butler insists that condemnation be accompanied by moral vision. Such a vision includes or may include equal grievability and rights to mourn, as well as, quote, new forms of political freedom and justice, end quote. For Butler, though, this vision excludes Hamas. Butler wants to be part of imagining and struggling for the kind of equality that would, quote, compel groups like Hamas to disappear. Now, it's not clear what counts as being like Hamas. Which characteristics would target a group for being disappeared? If, for example, what matters is the violent use of force, then the liberation struggle of a colonized, occupied, and oppressed people is ruled out in advance. The, the political horizon that united progressive forces at the end of the 70s totally disappears. With regard to wanting to compel groups like Hamas to disappear, Butler's position overlaps with Biden's and Netanyahu's. Unlike them, Butler names and rejects the occupation, but Butler echoes their position in their tactic of separating Hamas from Palestine and making Palestinian liberation conditional on this separation. She echoes this when, I mean, they echo this when Butler appears to be part of the struggle, um, when Butler, quote, aspires to be part of the struggle for a free Palestine in which Hamas would be dissolved. Okay? That's a quote from Butler's essay. A part, a struggle for a free Palestine in which Hamas would be dissolved, end quote. When Hamas is the widely acknowledged and accepted leader of the struggle for a free Palestine, hoping for its dissolution is a failure of international solidarity. It drives a wedge into a front united in resistance to Zionism and imperialism. Butler says that Hamas has, quote, one terrifying and appalling answer, end quote, to the question of what world is possible after the end of settler colonial rule. Butler doesn't tell us what Hamas's answer is. The political document that the movement issued in 27 accepted the creation of a Palestinian state on the 1967 borders. It accepted UN Resolution 194 for the right of return and the notion of restricting armed struggle to operate within the limits of, of international law. That doesn't strike me as terrifying or appalling, even if it is hard to imagine the, um, a two-state solution given the proliferation of illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. But even with those reasonable positions, that, those reasonable concessions, it's abominable, abhorrent to defend Hamas. It's headed off by condemnation in advance, as if to seal a door already closed and locked. Oppressed people fight back by any 
um, fight back against their oppressors by any means necessary. They choose and are forced to choose by the setting in which their liberation struggles take place, the strategies and tactics that they need to win. How much dissent will the oppressor tolerate? How much force will the oppressor use to quash rebellion? How dependent is the oppressor on the compliance of the oppressed? How much moral condemnation is the oppressor willing to absorb? To recognize the right to resist an oppressor the right of national self-determination means defending those willing and able to fight back against their oppressors, knowing that they're constantly raising and asking and answering those questions. Now, defense doesn't have to be uncritical. Individuals, groups, and states often find themselves in the political position of defending those with whom they disagree. But defense must take its orientation from the oppressed in their struggle for liberation not from the imperialist order that enables and validates oppression. Solidarity has to rise out of, quote, commonalities of resistance rather than commonalities of oppression, to use the formulation given by Robin D.G. Kelly. Again, as I already mentioned, this isn't new. There's a long history of this view in struggles for national liber liberation and self-determination. Imperialist institutions, from the state to the university, try to control what we can support, what we can say, and what we can feel. The terrorist designation and dramatic expansion of the definition of anti-Semitism, the emphasis on humanitarianism over politics, and the requirement that we condemn Hamas are all ways that, in, that, in, that imperialist institutions attempt to repress solidarity with Palestine. So then what happens? Well, depoliticized at the level of organization, issues get repoliticized at the individual level. So what does an individual think? And does she feel comfortable expressing it? What expressions threaten this comfort and undermine her sense of safe and undermine her sense of safety? On university campuses, the constriction of politics to managing individual feelings reframes self-centeredness as morally valid. Universities can then present themselves as caring when really what they're doing is protecting themselves from lawsuits and keeping donors happy. They suspend student groups, enforce absurd regulations, outlaw BDS, and restrict slogans. When students refuse to obey imperialism's and Zionism's rules for speaking out about Palestine, they're treated as if they were responsible for October 7th. A slogan on a university campus is taken to be an act of violence, a missile launched into a crowd where no one can flee to safety. None of this is neutral. The constriction of politics to the fake moral precepts of campus security is another moment in the systemic attempt to buttress imperial power. Restrictions on what we can say and how we can say it aim to redirect feelings and outrage away from apartheid occupation and blockade. They police an attempt, to, an attempt to control the affective environment that's enabling genocide. Feelings deemed inappropriate are met with disgust and condemned. So progressives who should know better start to make concessions. Let's not shout there is only one solution into a revolution if that makes people upset. There are alternatives that can make everyone comfortable and keep this genocide civil. But of course we know, right, there is only one solution in revolution. The policing of feeling and regulation, let me go back one. The policing of feeling and regulation of affect drove events at Cornell in October. Russell Rickford, he's a professor of African American history, he was condemned for calling the October 7th attack energizing and exhilarating. Cornell's president and the chair of its board of trustees issued a statement calling Rickford's, marks, rep, Rickford's remarks reprehensible. A petition demanding that he be fired got like 12,000 signatures. New York State Senator Kristen Gillibrand agreed that Rickford should be fired, say, saying, there's certainly no space for pro-Hamas protesters. That is someone who is supporting death, destruction, rape, murder, and slaughtering of innocent children and families and seniors and holding hostages, so that cannot be supported, end quote. Rickford apologized for the pain his remarks caused and took a leave of absence from the university. 
the images of paragliders evading Israeli air defenses was exhilarating. They showed us a moment of freedom, freedom from walls and the expectations of submission to occupation and siege. We witnessed seemingly impossible acts of bravery and defiance in the face of knowledge of the devastation that would follow. Right? That Israel practices asymmetric warfare and responds with disproportionate force is no secret, least of all the Palestinians. Who could not feel energized seeing oppressed people bulldozing the fences and closing them, taking to the skies and escape, and soaring in momentary freedom? The shattering of the collective sense of what is possible made it seem as if anyone could be free as if imperialism, occupation, and oppression can and will be overthrown. In her autobiography, Leila Haled reflects on a successful hijacking. It seemed the more spectacular the action, the better the morale of our people. Spectacular actions puncture expectations and create a new sense of possibility, liberating people from hopelessness and despair. When we witness such actions, Many of us also feel this sense of openness. Our response is indicative of the subject effect the actions unleash. Something in the world has changed because a subject has inscribed a gap in the given. We see the action as caused by a subject, producing that subject as a retroactive effect. Now, this theoretical language comes from Alain Badiou. And I'd be happy to talk about it um, afterwards. Um, I didn't want to do a whole bunch of bad use stuff here because I didn't think that's why you came. Um, but I did want to make sure that that point was there for um, folks who are interested in um, political theory um, and philosophy. Um, so what we see, though, is this, this subject effect. Right? A subject is produced. Now, imperialism wants to shut down these feelings before they spread too far. It condemns them and declares them off limits. Controlling speech and feeling is part of the political struggle. Anything that ignites the feeling that the oppressed will break free, that occupations and blockades will win, has to be extinguished. Imperialists and Zionists reduce October 7th to a list of horrors, not simply to block from view the history and reality of colonialism, occupation, and siege. They do it to prevent the gap of the disruption from producing the subject that caused it. As part of the struggle over what we can feel, I've assembled an affective carousel that takes the energies and feelings that Zionism and imperialism attempt to foreclose and uses them to force a gap in our sense of permissible feeling. So I'm gonna emphasize flight, taking to the skies, and the exhilaration of transcendence. Images associated with flying can incite solidarity with the freedom struggle, with the hope and the will to win. If they can escape, and they must escape, so can we all. The first intifada in 1987 began with the Night of the Gliders. On November 25th and 26th, two Palestinian guerrilla fighters from the Popular Front from the Liber for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, PFLPGC, they landed in Israeli-occupied territory. Now, both were killed. One killed six and injured seven Israeli soldiers before he died. Palestinians then made the guerrilla a national hero. Gazans wrote six to one on their walls to taunt the IDF troops. PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat praised the fighters, quote, the attack demonstrated that there could be no barriers or obstacles to prevent a guerrilla who has decided to become a martyr, end quote. Nothing could hold them down or block them if they had the will to fly. The Night of the Gliders reignited the affective energies of the Palestinian Revolution that had followed in the wake of Arab defeat in June 1967 and, and that had stimulated the growth of the guerrilla movement after the Battle of Karama in March 1968. After the Night of the Gliders and into the First Intifada, to be Palestinian again involved rebellion and resistance rather than acquiescence to second-class citizenship and refugee status. In 2018, during the Great March of Return, Gazans used kites and balloons to evade Israeli air defenses and start fires in Israeli territory. It seems as if Palestinian youth first started sending the fire kites, then Hamas got involved and created the Al Zawari unit that specialized in making and launching incendiary kites and balloons. 
They also inflated condoms and sent those flying over their face. The, um, the kites and balloons boosted morale in Gaza while damaging the Israeli economy and irritating Israelis living near the Gaza border. In response to an Italian journalist's remarks about the iconic new weapon that was driving Israel crazy, Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar explained, kites are not a weapon. At most, they seldom fire some stubble, an extinguisher and it's over. They are not a weapon, they are a message. Because they are just twine and paper and an oil-soaked rag, while each battery of the Iron Dome cost $100 million, those kites say, you are immensely more powerful, but you will never win, really, never. There's further context for reading kites in Gaza as messages from the people that refuse to submit. In 2011, 15,000 Palestinian children on a Gaza beach broke the world record for the most kites flown at the same time. Many of the kites featured Palestinian flags and symbols, as well as wishes for peace and hope. An 11-year-old girl, um, Raya, who made her kite the Palestinian flag said, when I fly it, I feel like I'm raising my country and my flag up, up in the sky. The 2013 documentary, Flying Paper, directed by Metin Sani and Roger Hill, tells the story of some of the young kite flyers. Quote, when we fly kites, we feel like we are the ones flying in the sky. We feel that we have freedom, that there is no siege in Gaza. When we fly the kite, we know that freedom exists, end quote. Earlier this year, kites and solidarity demonstrations took place around the world, expressing and amplifying a hope and a will for Palestinian freedom. Rafat al last poem, If I Must Die, draws on the association of kites and hope. I'm sure everyone has seen this, um, particularly the video with Brian Cox reading the poem that circulated after the IOF killed al in an airstrike. I'll just read the poem. If I must die, you must live to tell my story. To sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it, a white, make it white with a long tail. So that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his daddy left in the blaze, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, the kite you made, flying up above, he thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back life. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a story. The kite is a message of love. It's something made to fly and in flying create hope. Alarir's words attend to the making of the kite, its crafting out of cloth and strings, as well as its flight. Making the kite is more than mourning. It's an engagement in practical optimism, an element of the subjective process that establishes the subject of a politics, the you instructed to make the kite and tell his story. Uh, I, I put this in there. Um, this is just really kind of this awful kind of example of how, pe how um, kites are assembled that have to be repressed. If you see, um, if you see at the very top, this is an article from um, a news site for UK Lawyers for Israel that made sure that this Palestinian kite making workshop got canceled. This, a friend of mine who's an international lawyer sent me that when I told her when I was working on these flight things. She's like, oh yeah, you're so right about the kites. Um, one last example. Um, and this last example is also about the practical optimism that flight engenders, and it's Yasser Arafat International Airport. Palestinians built it in 1998. Israeli bulldozers demolished it in 2001 during the Second Intifada. Hind Hudori explains that the airport was deeply interconnected with the dream of Palestinian statehood. She interviewed workers who built the runway that's been, deuced, that's been reduced to rubble and sand. Hudori writes, quote, Gaza airport was more than a project. It was a symbol of freedom for Palestinians. Flying the Palestinian flag in the sky was the dream of every Palestinian. The paragliders who flew into Israel on October 7th continue the revolutionary association of liberation and flight. Although imperialist and Zionist forces try to condense the action onto a singular figure of Hamas terrorism, insisting against all evidence to the contrary that with the extermination of Hamas, Palestinian resistance will disappear, the will to fight for Palestinian freedom precedes and exceeds Hamas. Hamas wasn't the subject of the October 7th action. 
It was an agent hoping that the subject would emerge as an effect of its action, the latest instantiation of the Palestinian revolution. Words used by Leila Haled to defend the justness of the PFLP's hijacking tactic apply equally well to October 7th. Haled writes, as a comrade has said, we act heroically in a cowardly world to prove that the enemy is not invincible. We act violently in order to blow the wax out of the ears of deaf Western liberals and to remove the straw that blocks their vision. We act as revolutionaries to inspire the masses and to trigger off the revolutionary upheaval in an era of counter-revolution. How can an oppressed people believe that change is possible? How can movements that have experienced decades of defeat ever feel like our fights are winnable? Sarah Roy documented the despair of pervading Gaza and the West Bank prior to October 7th. Factionalism and the sense that not just Fatah, but Hamas as well was cooperating too much with Israel had unraveled confidence in any national unifying project. A friend told Roy, our past demands have become meaningless. No one speaks of Jerusalem or the right of return. We just want food security and open crossings. And Al-Aqsa flood attacked that despair. The coalition of resistance fighters led by Hamas and PIJ, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, they refused to accept defeat and submit to the indignity of slow death. Their action was designed so that the revolutionary subject would appear as its effect. Now, in 2017, the PFLP, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, republished its 1969 document, um, The Strategy for the Liberation of Palestine. So it was part of the, the party's 50th um, anniversary celebration. The original text was drafted in 1967, though published um, in 69, um, and it was drafted following the Arab defeat in the June War. And it's the party's founding document, and it's utterly fascinating. You can get it for free online, Strategy for the Liberation of Palestine. It's really interesting. I highly recommend it. Because um, it gives you this really neat window into the revolutionary world of African, Asian, Arab, and Latin, Latin American um, national liberation movements. What's super interesting is its presentation of imperialism as the international context necessary for understanding the Palestinian struggle. The PFLP outlines changes in imperialism following the Second World War, the most significant being the gathering together of the colonial capitalist forces in one camp led by US capital and the constitution of the socialist countries and liberation struggles as an opposing revolutionary camp. According to the PFLP's analysis, the United States attempts to realize its interests through neo-colonialist techniques that endeavor to contain and coexist with national liberation struggles. Nevertheless, the party observes, US invasions of Vietnam, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic prove that the US will use armed force. The US will use armed force. Accordingly, after it failed in its attempts to bargain with the Arab liberation movement, and keep it going from, or, and keep it from organic fusion with the world revolutionary camp, the US gave full military support to Israel, right? It might try a neo-colonialist method, but if it can't get it, it's gonna go in militarily, and the US did that, going in full of military, giving full military support to Israel. So, based then, with imperialism's enormous support and technological advantage, the PFLP concluded that Palestine, as a matter of strategy, has to enter into full alliance with all the revolutionary forces on the world level. So as the document states, the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America are daily suffering the life of wretchedness, poverty, ignorance, and backwardness, which is a result of colonialism and imperialism in their lives. The major conflict experienced by the world of today is the conflict between, the con between exploiting world imperialism on the one hand and these peoples and the socialist camp on the other. The alliance of Palestinian and Arab national liberation movement with the liberation movement in Vietnam, the revolutionary situation in Cuba, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the national liberation movements in Asia, Africa, and Latin America is the only way to create the camp that is capable of facing and triumphing over the imperialist camp. In other words, 
Not everyone speaks for Palestine, but Palestine speaks for everyone. The PFLP strategy for national liberation demonstrates why. The PFLP's aim is establishing a democratic national state in Palestine where Arabs and Jews will be citizens with equal rights and obligations. This liberatory aim brings it into conflict with the ethno-nationalist state of Israel, it brings it into conflict with, Zionist, with Zionism as a racist ideology, and with imperialism as the force that, that supports and exploits Israel as part of its larger territorial division of the world and expropriation of Asian and African resources. The political solution to the problem of Palestine thus necessarily unfolds as a global struggle against imperialism. The we of we are all Palestinians is the name of the side that fights for all of us. Already by the time the document was published, Palestine had become a global cause for the left, an iconic symbol of solidarity and support. In the words of Qasem Kanafani, which is quote, they're quoted, these words are quoted in that document, the Palestinian cause is not a cause for Palestinians only, but a cause for every revolutionary wherever they are as a cause for the, of the exploited and oppressed masses in our era. Um, Kanafani was assassinated by Israel in 1972, and he's a writer and founding member of the PFLP. To conclude, I've talked about the ways that imperialist institutions try to repress Palestinian solidarity and the revolutionary subject by policing what we can support, say, and feel. I've used images of flight to evoke a different structure of feeling, one that takes its lead from the Palestinian revolution. And I've emphasized the important analysis from the PFLP that demonstrates why the Palestinian struggle is at the core of the struggle against imperialism. As you know, some universities have banned from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. There's been a national and international debate over the slogan, which is another part of the war on feeling solidarity with Palestine, and, and an, another attempt to extinguish the subjective process that October 7th ignited. But what the imperialists really should get, about, get upset about is the slogan, in our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. Because that slogan rejects fragmentation, and recognizes the anti-imperialist subject as an effect of the Palestinian cause. It replaces humanitarian management with an insistence on freedom. Taking the side of Palestinian resistance, one responds to a revolutionary subject, the, fighting, the, the subject fighting against apartheid and occupation. Which side are you on? Liberation or Zionism and imperialism? The millions or the few? There are two sides, no alternative, no negotiation of the relation between oppressor and oppressed. The two sides employ radically different orders of meaning. From within one, the other appears crazed and monstrous, utterly nonsensical. But there's not a third point, no third position from which to assess the situation as if there's some neutral authority or system of legality that's not already swept into one side or the other. The division that's constitutive of the political goes all the way down. Palestine names a side in the struggle against imperialism. When the Palestinian resistance dramatically punctures its setting of occupation and oppression, the fact of this side reemerges. It confronts an order that wants to exterminate it with the fact of a continued will to persist, to redress injustice, to reclaim what has been taken, and to be recognized as a people, a nation, a state, with a right of self-determination. Millions of people around the world then become the revolutionary subject that will ensure that Palestine will be free. So that's it.